If you're even good Where anyone at all We interrupt this program to bring you a special bulletin from ABC Radio. Three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade today in downtown Dallas, Texas. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Diana, Princess of Wales, has died after a car crash in Paris. The French government announced her death just before five o'clock this morning. I have a dream. Yeah. And my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commands us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to cast a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the oldest ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Are you riveted, captivated by our Coca-Cola radio? Today we begin a new series entitled Captivate. And the whole idea of this series is to ask the question, how can we live such lives where Christ is captivating in us to others we meet? How can Christ be compelling in us? How can we live in such a way where Christ's message radiates through us so captivating that people want to stop and take notice? It's a big question we're asking. We just came out of the series called Not a Fan, and we were asking that we were, we were hoping that we would become so captivated with God that we would move from a fan to a follower, but we, it can't stop there. It can't just stop with me being captivated. We have to allow Jesus to be captivating through us in order for them to see Jesus and to know Jesus. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time that you were truly captivated? Just think about it for a moment. When was the last time that you were truly captivated? captivated, that you stopped and you're, you're awe-stricken, you're just kind of totally mesmerized by the moment. Maybe it was, a, maybe it was an event you were at, and you, it was something you, 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 something you took part of that made you stop, or a person you met, or, or a relationship you were in. Maybe it was something you experienced for the first time that you couldn't believe was happening to you. You weren't even sure what was going on, and you were awe-stricken, you were captivated that you were able to experience this moment. Maybe it was something you saw for the very first time. Maybe you, went, you saw the Eiffel Tower or you saw one of these. Maybe you stand at, at uh, Niagara Falls and you look at it and you just allow yourself to be captivated by what is actually before you. When was the last time you were truly captivated? Let me ask you another question. How did it make you feel? How did it make you feel inside? For a moment, you, you feel like everything changed. You got a whole new epiphany on life. Everything looks different, even just for a moment. See, if you're like me, something happens when you become truly captivated by something. You know what it is? You want to experience it again. You want to experience it again. And not only do you want to experience it again, you want to tell somebody about that experience. It's like um, Apple. God bless the makers of Apple. Apple phones, every year they come out, every, and, and all Apple lovers in the house, just give me a, oh yeah. There's a few of us. I was cracking, a little voice crack going on. Um, 
But Apple, they are so good at it. They, they kind of have the release date set. You know, okay, they're releasing a new product. There's all this hype. There's all this circumstance. You don't know what's going to happen. And then they release this product, and all of a sudden, the Apple iPhone 4S, which I have, sucks comparison to the Apple 5, right? They totally rivet you by this Apple 5, and you're kind of, your iPhone 5, and you're sitting there, and you're like, I want that. And the way they talk about how they made it, they handcrafted it with the finest steel, known to man forge in the mountains of the, 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 you know, the, 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 uh, the mountains of Mordor, you know, like this whole... But you're, you're captivated, you're riveted by it. And so you're, all you can think about now is, how do I get that phone? i got to get that phone. I know I'm in a contract, but i got to figure out a way to get that phone. Right? And so you, you're captivated by it. And I don't know what it's like for you. I remember the first time um, I was like in high school, I went to a Jeff Moore and the Distance concert. I don't know if anybody remembers that band. <laughs> Jeff Moore was actually here so, uh, probably, I think, last year ago, last year ago, a year ago. And, uh, but I remember going to Jeff Moore and the Distance concert. I was, in, I was a young guy, probably grade eight or nine. And uh, it was at the Queensway in Toronto. It was packed. It was just like awesome. And I remember it was the bass guy came up and he kind of came to the front of the stage and he had his bass, you know, kind of rocking out. He has long hair. And he just stood there and there's like 4,000 people and they're all staring at him and they're like, yeah. And he just took it in, right? And then he does this slap of a one string and everyone just hangs on that note. And I'm like on the edge of my seat, totally pulled into what's happening right now. And then he just goes off for about five minutes, just crazy bass solo, slap bass stuff, just, ri- and I'm there going, and I'm captivated. And he's held my attention so much so that it changed everything. That's when I actually started playing bass. That's the, that was the moment that said, I actually want to do this. And I, that's when I started playing bass for the first time, which led to guitar, which led to all the other things. And, and there was that moment that captivated me, that changed my direction, that led me on a path that changed my life, that led me in a whole different direction. And uh, it was moments like that that captivate you. See, when you're truly captivated by something, you're willing to make incredible sacrifices in order to experience that again. When you're captivated by something, you're willing to do whatever it takes to experience it, to know it, to, to tell people about it. So let me ask you, an honest question. When was the last time you were actually captivated by Jesus? And I know we're in church. That's a silly question to ask. So simple. But let me ask you again, and I want you to just be honest with the response. When was the last time that you were captivated by Jesus? How do you know, that, how do you know the answer to that question? Maybe some of you can remember a moment or a time that you were captivated, but in the last little while, you're like, you know what, I don't know if I've ever been captivated in the last little while. But how do you know? How do you answer that question? You, you know you're captivated when you're willing to do anything to experience that life that he gives. Not only that, you're willing to do everything you can to make sure that others have an opportunity to experience that life that we have to know in Jesus. See, when you're captivated by it, you want to be with him. Not only do you want to be with it, you want to tell everybody about it. Captivated. So the interesting thing is this. When you're truly captivated by Jesus, you in turn become captivating. When you're captivated by something, you become captivating to those around you because of his amazing love and grace at work in your life. So over the next four weeks, we're going to be discovering uh, four frequencies, four frequencies of faith. That when we tune into the frequencies, we allow the grace to come through us. We allow the essence of Christ to radiate and to, to shine through us in order so that people can hear Jesus and hear the message and see Jesus clearly. So that's the focus we're going to go today. So today we're going to begin our discussion by talking about an encounter that Jesus had with a woman. He had an encounter with a woman and a group of Pharisees. And, uh, and we're going to see for ourselves what was so captivating about his experience, that his interaction with, women, that with this woman that we can take upon ourselves and we can allow to shine through our lives so that we in turn become, can become captivating. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them up to John 8. Bibles, again, are a great thing to bring with you to church. I know we do have them on the screen, but something about marking it up in your Bible and circling and highlighting things. So I just want to encourage you to do that. But let's turn to John 8. It will be on the screens. But before we do, let's just open in a word of prayer, all right? Father, we just thank you so much uh, that you came to us We thank you for this day, Lord, that we can come to you. We thank you, Lord, that you are here. And we pray, Lord, that as we open up your word, as we discuss truth, as we uh, gleam from Scripture, God, that you would, first of all, captivate our hearts once again. God, that our hearts would be just awestricken by your grace, awestricken by your mercy and your love for us. And God, that we would in turn live that out as we leave this place. And so, Jesus, we open your word. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Everyone said... 
Amen. So let's read uh, John 8, starting at verse 2. It reads this. At dawn, he, which is Jesus, appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people were gathered around him. And he sat down to teach, teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And they, had, they, had, they, had, they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now let's just push pause for a second. See, the other thing we need to know in this scripture is that the Mosaic Law, it was that both parties who were caught in the act of adultery were to be stoned. Not just the woman, both parties. But the man was nowhere to be found in this story. So there's something up, and Jesus is aware of that. So let's continue. In the law that Moses commanded us to stone such a woman, what do you say? So they were using this question to trap him in order to have a basis for accusing him. Again, we'll push pause. The trap here is that if he was lax towards the Jewish law, then the Jewish leaders would be angry at him because he's not living up to the Jewish law. However, if he condoned the stoning, then he would be in trouble with the Roman law because you are not allowed to sentence anybody to death without Roman authority. So he's kind of caught in the middle of a heart, uh, in a rock and a hard spot. No pun intended. He's kind of caught in the middle here. And so that's the trap that they're setting for him. But Jesus bent down and started to write it in the ground with his fingers. But they kept on questioning him. He, he straightened up and he said to them, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and began to write in the sand. At this, those who heard began to walk away one at a time, the oldest one first, until Jesus was left. Then the woman standing there, uh, with, with the woman standing there, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. Then neither I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. You see, as we read this story, and as I read this story again this week, it, the one thing becomes incredibly apparent in this story, in Jesus' interaction with the accused, the guilty, the shamed. And did you catch it? It's grace. The frequency we're going to talk about today is the frequency of grace. Jesus looks at the accused. He, he looks at the, the, the woman broken and, and with and the, the whole message of the gospel story is this. It's this unmerited, undeserved, unearned grace. Jesus sees her and he shows her grace like she's never experienced before. Not only that, but he calls her to something different. He calls her to something better. Now, I can only imagine the disciples looking on. He's gathered her. He's teaching. He's at the temple. His disciples are there. There's lots of commotion. There's other, uh, other rabbis, teachers. There's lots of people gathered around. And I can only gather the imagine, uh, imagine what they were feeling as, as they watched Jesus interact in this, in this moment. I, I can only imagine the tension as the gathered as spectators stood from a distance and to see what Jesus would do in response to the Pharisees' accusations and, and demands. Captivated. Riveted. Uncertain of what he's writing in the ground. We don't know what he wrote in the ground, but captivated by his response. Captivated by his grace. So as we examine this story, we're going to discover and we're going to tune into the frequency of grace and figure out how we can allow the frequency of grace to shine through our life. But in order to understand that there's three stages that happen in this story, we're going to discover them all this morning. The first stage is this, is guilt. The first understanding is that there is, we are guilty. And before we dismiss the adulterous woman, in the story, which were easy to do. She sinned. She deserves it. She should be stoned. The, uh, uh, listen to the law. Obey the law. She made, she made a mistake. We're really quickly to point our finger. But before we do that, we need to first understand that we are all that woman. We are all been. We have all been that woman. At some point, we have been guilty. Every one of us in this room has been in that stage where we are caught in a cycle, in a circle of guilt and shame. Romans 8 uh, Romans 3.23 rather says, For all have sinned. All of us have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all done things that aren't right. We've, we've all made decisions that went against God's principles. We've all chosen to disobey rather than pay the cost of obedience. We've all made mistakes and have, have lived in the guilt of those consequences, feeling, feeling like we don't measure up, feeling like we don't have what it takes. We struggle with addiction, so we look for the weaknesses in others to, to point the blame, to shift the blame. To divert the eyes of, of our onlookers so we can feel better about ourselves. We've been wronged and accused, humiliated like the woman in the story. You see, guilt is a lot like these rocks. Guilt is a lot like these rocks. When we, when we feel guilty, they illustrate for us the guilt that we, we get upon ourselves when we fall short, when we miss the mark. We, get it, we gather another rock. We build up ammo so that when somebody points out the guilt in us, we can throw it at them. 
If he gets up, so when, when, the, when it gets too heavy, when there's too much for us to bear, we, and we can find somebody who's more guilty, who's not measuring up as much, we can hurl the rocks and divert the attention. But here's the thing. Religion and grace cannot coexist. Religion and grace cannot coexist. Religion is about control and, and rigid rules most of which are impossible to maintain. Religion withholds approval and keeps people on the outs by hurling rocks. Religion makes Jesus look mean because you have to abide by these certain rules. You, God is not fair because those are impossible to live up to. These laws or these rules are impossible to maintain. And so God looks mean to the outsider. It's exclusive rather than inclusive. It thrives on condemnation because it makes you feel better about your own mistakes by casting, by your own sins, by casting insults and, hur and hurling rocks at others. Religious people hide behind their rocks so that other people won't be able to see who they truly are. Deflecting, blaming, turning the attention on the more guilty. See, somehow, over a period of time, religious people look at their beliefs we look at their actions and believe that their works alone are enough. Somehow something shifts over time. That the rituals of faith are what sustain their faith. That the rich, their practices are what make Jesus love them more. They say the right things at the right time. They, they never miss a Sunday. Always going to church. They don't drink or chew or go with girls who do. They don't swear. They pray before each meal, but not out of a heart of thanksgiving, but out of a ritual, a routine. They fall into the trap. Yes, all of us, if we aren't careful, begin to measure our faith by what I do. And I'm not saying that the Bible says, show me your faith by, by what you say. I'll show you my faith by what I do. So I, there is an element of deeds when it comes to faith. But that's not what we're talking about now. They, it's by their rituals of faith, by their practices of faith. We believe that that's all enough. And when we believe that, then grace has no merit. Grace doesn't matter anymore. And that's where we run into the problem. See, Galatians 2, 21, it says this. It says, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. So it's not our works. It's not our righteousness that saves us. It's not our righteousness that sustains us. We've done nothing to earn it. We've done nothing to deserve it. We are the woman fallen in the dirt and in front of Jesus, guilty, shamed, caught in the act. We have nothing to say, nothing to defend ourselves. But we're thankful that in Romans it says, but God demonstrates his own love for this, that while we were sinners, while we, while we didn't deserve it all, Christ died for us. We are all guilty. Every one of us in this room are guilty. Needing, an, needing Jesus, needing someone to have grace on us. See, Jesus sees us as he saw this woman lying in the dirt, scorned, shamed, accused, guilty. He sees a situation we're in, unable to step out of it on our own. We are lost without him. He sees that the gap between himself and us has grown way too large, and we are unable to cross it. And soon, you know what grace does? Grace says that God came to me. Grace is that God comes to me to me, despite me and all that I have done, God comes to me. As soon as we forget that, as soon as we think that it's by our works, it's by our deeds, it's by our righteousness, then grace isn't able to throw, th well, to move through us. As soon as we believe that it's by, that I deserve the grace because of what I've done and what I continue to do and who I am, and that I don't do that and I've never done that, I deserve grace, then grace is unable to filter and flow through us. Only when we, re only when we understand that we have done nothing to receive grace, and we've received grace freely, is grace able to flow through us. So in order to receive God's grace, in order to walk in God's grace, we have to first drop the rocks. We have to first realize, God, this is nothing I've done. I'm going to live for you, and I'm going to do my, my work for you as best as I can, but I understand that that all pales. That is not why you save me. You save me because you love me. You love me. And so you give me something I don't deserve. Because I didn't earn one inch of it. But you love me. So we're all guilty. We have to first embrace that. We have to recognize that. We have to own that. But here's the second stage. We get to have an intervention with Jesus. 
See, this adulterous woman is found at the feet of Jesus, and she has a stage two intervention with Jesus. Do you know thing? I think sometimes we've mistaken grace for tolerance, haven't we? We've mistaken grace for tolerance. We often look at grace as saying that I won't judge you. You know what? Just do whatever you want. Just do it. I'm not going to judge you. I love you for who you are. Just keep on doing what you're doing. And, and somehow we feel that as we stand idly by, that they're going to see Jesus in us in that act, and we can just tolerate what they're doing. We're going to condone sort of what they're doing, loosely condone it, but Jesus is gonna, we're going to see Jesus in that somehow. But that's not what grace is all about. Grace is bigger than that. Grace isn't tolerance. See, in the story, Jesus sees this woman. He, she's caught. She's guilty. She's been publicly shamed. And, but he doesn't condemn her. This is an interesting part. Jesus knows, because Jesus knows everything. He knows this woman's story. He doesn't have to ask it. He knows what's going on. But he doesn't publicly condemn her. He doesn't even privately condemn her. He just says, now go and leave your life of sin. He calls her to something greater. Listen to this. Grace calls you to something greater. Grace is intolerance. Grace is an intervention. Grace is an intervention. God loved me. Grace loved me, accepted me, forgave me, but didn't leave me in the mire. Didn't leave me in the muck and say, just, it's okay, I've forgiven you, but you can just stay down there. But it called me to something better. He saw in me what I couldn't see in myself, and he called me to that life. Grace sees you the way you cannot see yourself and calls you to something greater. Calls you to something better. Uh, Ephesians, it says, For it is by grace we've been saved through faith that is not from yourselves, but is a gift from God. God sees us, and he gives us this gift of grace and pulls us out and gives us something better. Listen, if grace has to be earned, it's not grace any longer, is it? If grace has to be earned, it's not grace any longer. It's available to the messiest of people in the messiest situations, and I know that doesn't make any sense for us. I know that it's hard for us to understand, and in our own finite mind, it's not fair. It's not fair that I can live my life, and I can be, I can be, uh, walk on that, on that narrow road. I can stay, keep Jesus focused. My whole life, 88 years of my life, I'm being focused on Jesus. And this guy over here can do anything he wants, sin, live, as whatever, in the last moments, receive God, and God's grace covers him the same way that God's grace covers me. How is that fair? And we judge that, don't we? The example, the example is the guy on the cross beside Jesus. He lived a life completely anti-God, away from God. He just served himself, served his own desires, served his own needs. And he's being punished for it. And he's hanging there on the cross. And in his last days, in his last moments, his last breaths, he turns to Jesus and says, Jesus, will you remember me? He did nothing to deserve it. He did not live a righteous life. He lived for himself. But what does Jesus do? He turns to him and he says, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Grace. Covered. Pulled them out. Called them to something better. So we don't understand grace. But where would any of us be without it? We have all had an intervention with Jesus. We've all been called, and grace has called us, and covered us, and called us as something better. I'm sure that if we were to sit here for a moment, it wouldn't be long before we can all picture somebody in our life, whether it's a family, a parent, or a teacher, or a pastor, or a leader, or a life group leader, a mentor, somebody who, is, who saw us as we could be, not as we are. And grace covered us and helped us walk into something that we could be better, right? Every one of us, we can, if we just allowed ourselves to think, we can, we can picture that person in our life. Remember, I was in my second year of Bible college. And uh, I was still young, and I was growing in my character and maturity, and my character was flawed. And I got caught in an act that was ungodly. And I remember I was in chapel, you know, trying to hide it, trying to shove it under the corner, didn't want anybody to know. And somehow our dean of students found out, and he pulled, tapped me on the shoulder in the middle of the worship, he tapped me on the shoulder, and he says, Adam, come on, we'll talk to you for a second. Instantly, just guilt, condemnation, just knowing I'm caught, something's not right, this doesn't normally happen. He pulls me down to his office, and he sits me in the chair, and he just looks at me. I said, what's up, Adam? You know, I'm trying to hide, oh, everything's good, it's all good, what's up? He's like, do you have something to tell me? No, I don't have anything to tell you. I mean, what is that kind of question? Do you have something to tell me? You're awesome. You know, <laughs> what do you want to know, you know? And you don't want to say anything, because you're not sure what he knows, Right? So you don't want to give anything away. But then he just started talking. 
And he just started, he just started revealing the flaw in my character. And here's the thing he said to me, because I was mad, I was angry, because there was consequences to the choices I made that weren't fun, that I had to walk through a season I had to walk through. But I remember he said to me, he's like, Adam, I love you enough for you to hate me. And that was it. I love you enough for you to hate me, and I know I'm not going to leave you. I recognize that you've made mistakes, but I'm going to call you out of that. I'm going to... Grace is going to call you to something better. I love you enough for you to hate me right now, but it's okay. We're going to cover you. And that moment, that was a catalytic moment in my life that shifted my trajectory, the road that I was on. Grace saw me as I, a man saw me as I was, but grace covered me and pulled me out and gave me another chance. I had an intervention with Jesus through this man. I've never been the same for it. I've never been the same since. I remember I saw him years ago after I graduated. I just, there's just always something going to be in him that I'm just solely attracted to because of his grace that covered me in that situation where I didn't deserve it. I made the mistake. I chose to do what I did. But he covered me. So grace covers us. We have an intervention with Jesus. Grace calls us to something better. If we truly receive grace, if we've truly been captivated by the grace giver, not only do we live in that grace, but we want others to live as freely in it as possible. Which leads us to the third stage. We have an opportunity, church. This is the good news. As a church, we have an opportunity to become agents of grace. Church, not only have have we been guilty, not only has grace covered us and called us to something greater, but now we in return have an opportunity to be agents of grace in other people's lives. We get to be the Mark Hawks in my life to other people. The church gets to represent grace to our community. I'm a, I'm a, in my conversations, my research, I'm not really sure if that's the first thing that the church, uh, that people outside the church think of the church. When they're caught and they're, they're walking in something that they know is not right themselves, is the church going to cover them or is the church going to condemn them? What is the reputation we have as a church? Are we known as agents of grace? Are we known as people who are quick to throw rocks? Talk to your friends. The church. Are we known as people of agents of grace? Are we known as people who throw rocks? Unfortunately, through our own fault and our own actions, our own insecurities and our own misunderstanding of what grace truly is, my fear is that majority of people view the church, the church, as a place that throws rocks not as agents of grace. But here's the good news. We get to change that. We can change that, church. As a body, we can change that. We can become agents of grace to our community. See, our position is not to act as judge or juror against others, but rather become agents of grace in hopes that one day it will open the door for people to see Jesus. That they'll see Jesus in us, that something is so compelling in us that it wants them to know what's going on. It's hard, it's easy to judge people when you haven't walked in their shoes or, or lived their life. Sometimes failure is, is life's greatest teacher. And failure is the one thing that God uses to bring people to himself. We have a God of compassion who meets us at our lowest needs. Who meets us at our lowest needs. And pulls us to something greater. Calls us to something greater. So Jesus becomes an agent of grace to this girl. This woman. Who condemns you. I don't condemn you. But I'm not going to leave you down here. I want you to now go and leave your life of sin. Be better. And we don't know what happens with this woman. The story kind of ends there for her. I would love to imagine that in turn she becomes now an agent of grace. I would love to in turn, I would love to imagine that now wherever she goes, she received the grace of God and now she's able to tell people about it. See, grace goes beyond forgiveness and mercy. It isn't just provision. Provision covers us, but grace is also power. Grace also gives us the power to live a life of grace to others. Gordon MacDonald says this, The world can do almost anything as well or as better as the church. You need not be a Christian to build houses or feed the hungry or heal the sick. There is only one thing that the world cannot do. The world cannot offer grace. So as a church, it's awesome 
that were involved in inju- injustice stuff. It's awesome that we have these housing projects. It's awesome that we raise food to heal, to give people food. It's awesome. That's great. But beyond all that, the one thing that we carry that the world cannot offer is grace. Is the loving and accepting of who they are, but calling them to something better, leading them to a life and introducing them to the grace giver, tuning into the frequency of grace. So what does this look like? What does an agent of grace look like? You're sitting here, I want to be an agent of grace. What's that look like? For, you know, I know that we say this all the time, but you, you love the sinner, but you hate the sin. We have to be careful that we don't see people by what they do and, and judge them by that, but we see the person. I'm so grateful that Jesus didn't just see what I did, but he sees who I am. He didn't just see what I did, but he can see who I can become. He saw who I can become. And because of that, I was able to respond to his grace. That we see beyond the temporary, we, we see beyond the current and the reality, and we see what could be. We forgive freely as we have also been forgiven freely. Andy Stanley talks about we do, we do for one what we wish we could do for everybody. Maybe we can't be that with everybody. We just passionately do for one what you wish you could do for everybody. Andy, uh, Philip Yancey in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, he, wrote, he writes this, and it just it helps sums up this whole point. It says this, I never find forgiveness easy. I rarely do find it complete, and rarely do I find it completely satisfying. Nagging injustices remain, and the wounds still cause pain. I have, I have to approach God again and again, yielding to him the residue of what I thought I committed to him long ago. I do so because the gospel makes it clear the connection. God forgives my debts as I forgive my debtors. And the reverse is also true. Only by living in the stream of God's grace will I find the strength to respond with grace towards others. Only by living in the stream of God's grace will I find the strength to respond with grace to others. You see, church, as soon as we forget that we are saved by grace, as soon as we forget that this life that we receive, this life that we live, this hope that we have found has been given to us simply by grace, then we fail to be agents of grace. We, we, we are unable to be agents of grace because we think we deserved it. We think we have earned it. We think we are owed what, we have, what is before us. See, so on this Thanksgiving weekend, I can't think of anything more, anything more to be thankful for than the grace of God. On this Thanksgiving meeting, I can't think of one thing to be thankful for more, more than the grace, the second chance that God has given us. If God doesn't answer any of my prayers, if he doesn't heal any of my family, if he doesn't give me the job I want or heal the sick, or if he doesn't do anything else beyond giving me a second chance, that's more than enough. Church, that's more than enough to be thankful to God. Because he saw us as we were, and he didn't leave us there. He saw that the gap was too big for us to cross, and so God comes to me. And here's the thing about grace. God, grace, God comes to me, but in grace, God also carries me. Grace says that God also carries me, and he takes the weight off my shoulders, and he leads me. It means he controls me, too. It means I go where he goes, and I have to do what he tells me to do. But grace covers me. Grace carries me, and grace controls me. So my question this morning is this, church. What frequency are you tuned into this morning? What frequency are you allowing to speak through your life? See, if we're just the radio, and God's the voice, grace is the voice, if you're tuned into the frequency of guilt, then all that's going to come out is guilt. If you're tuned into the frequency of judgment, then all you do is judge. But if we're turned into the frequency of grace then grace speaks out of our lives freely. So what frequency are you turned into? Andy Stanley says this, and I believe 100%. The church is the most appealing when the message of grace is the most apparent. The church, the body, the believers, the, the family of God is the most appealing when the message of grace, when the frequency of grace is the most apparent. So in closing, I have three questions for you this morning. One, have you received the grace of God? 
Have you received the grace of God? Maybe you're sitting here today and you've never received God's grace in your life. Maybe, you, maybe you, right now you will find yourself and you feel you are the woman thrown at the feet of Jesus, accused, caught, shamed, scorned. You are, you are guilty. And you recognize that you are in need of a Savior. You know you're flawed. You know you made a mistake. And you need God's grace to cover you. I want to tell you this morning, church, that God's grace, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've, what you've said or who you've hurt. God's grace covers you. Secondly, maybe you received God's grace. But are you giving grace freely, as freely as it was given to you? Maybe it's been a long time since you've given grace. Maybe for a long, a long time you've been tuned into the frequency of guilt. Maybe for a while you've been hoarding and stacking up rocks just in case you need them. Just in case you need to defend yourself. God's telling you right now to drop the rocks. Receive his grace freely again and be a giver of grace. And the third question is this. Who in your life can you become an agent of grace to? Who in your life can you become an agent of grace to? Who in your life can you lead to Jesus? See, this whole series we're going to be talking about is purely about just being Jesus to people. Living a life that's so captivating that our, our friends, our families, our co-workers want what is radiating and, and speaking through our life. So who are you going to be an agent of grace to? Let's pray. Father, first of all, we just want to say thank you for your grace. Father, right now, we just humble ourselves and we remind ourselves once again that it's not by anything we have done, not by anything we have done, but purely by your immense love for us that you crossed the gap and you came to us. So this morning, Jesus, we just say thank you. We thank you that your grace covers us, that your grace calls us to something greater. And God, this morning, if we have been stuck in the mire, if we've been stuck down, God, I pray that you would just give us the courage and the strength to stand up, the courage and the grace to live the life that you've called us to live. And so, God, I just pray, first of all, that you'd speak to our hearts, that you would remind us again that we are saved by grace. Second, God, that you would allow grace to flow free, freely through us that the frequency of grace and the message of grace would reign through our life. And thirdly, God, that you would give us the opportunity. Give us the opportunity, God, to be agents of grace in this community. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.